Please note, for this video, there will be some language that will be slightly different depending on your setting. The upcoming scenario uses the term carers to refer to home care workers. My name's Walter Lloyd Smith and I'm the manager with the Norfolk Safeguarding Adults Board. In this short video today, I'm going to talk about some of the issues around safeguarding a person with dementia living in their own homes. Many of the things that you'll be very skilled at doing. So this is a, a, a short case study, and I'm gonna call this lady Joyce. Joyce is 94, and she lives in her own home. And she's lived there for many, many years. Being in her own home is incredibly important to her, but her social network and support isn't particularly wide or extensive, but she is supported by her neighbors. However, because of her dementia, her needs are starting to change and that's prompted the need uh, for um, a care package supporting with carers coming in to see Joyce every day. And they're helping her with things like meal preparation, medication, and some personal care as well. But up until that point, Joyce was supported by, by her neighbors. Also in Joyce's life, and this is important, is there is a, um, a lasting power of attorney which is held by a friend but the friend lives many miles away from Joyce she's not local but that's an important point that I'll come back to in a moment so the carers are coming in to see Joyce and shortly after this the neighbors are also becoming involved um, and they're telling the carers you know how to how to do things and how Joyce likes them done as I say, the carers are visiting three times a day and they're helping Joyce with a number of things because of her dementia. So as I said, carers are, uh, are visiting Joyce and the neighbours are also um, involved and they're trying to share their understanding and knowledge of Joyce. And this could be quite important, you know, um, we should always look for people around a person because they may know them best. And as you start to meet a new client, they're a really important source of information and advice. But the neighbours in this example are, are starting to sort of be, be more involved. They're trying to tell the carers perhaps how, how to, do, to do their job. And that's always isn't easy. There's always some potential tensions there. But it's important that we, that we take the opportunity to listen to what the carers are having to tell us. But what we do notice is that the, the neighbors are, are locking, locking Joyce uh, in, in her own home. They're, they're sort of concerned that she may, may wander. Um, and for people with dementia, this again can be, can be a feature. But is that a safeguarding issue? Well, the important, issue, the important point here is to explore that with the, with the neighbours. What are their concerns? Has it happened before? Has there been uh, any incidents where uh, Joyce was put at risk? We all, all of us lock our doors at night, don't we? Indeed. So it might not be a particular real concern at this point for, for Joyce and the care we're, we're providing to her. But the carers are concerned. So what they do, and this is again, a very positive step, is that, that catches their attention. That catches their, if you like, it's a ping on their radar. So they contact the lasting power of attorney. And the lasting power of attorney is there to support Joyce, to look after her, her best interests. And they share those concerns. Is this in Joyce's best interest? to have the neighbors involved in this way. Now the carers are there, um, but also the locking of the door. And as you can see, the, the, the uh, lasting power of attorney is, isn't overly concerned. Um, and they, up until now, the, the attorney has relied very much on the neighbors to look out for Joyce, to, to make sure that she gets the things that she needs on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, because she's uh, the, the power of attorney is so far away. So at this point, 
the attorney isn't necessarily overly concerned. But the situation changes and these problems start to continue and there is, there is a tension between the care staff going in and the continual involvement uh, of, of the neighbours. And this is important now because it is potentially impacting on the care and support that we, we need to see uh, Joyce receives. Again, the issue of locking Joyce uh, in her home uh, and at night uh, to stop her wandering uh, is the explanation that's given by the carers. This is an important point for people with dementia because just because a person has dementia doesn't mean that they shouldn't take, take risks. We all have risks in our lives and that is no different for someone who has dementia. What we need to do is explore wherever possible with the neighbours in this example, the opportunity for Joyce to take positive risks while understanding what the potential consequences may be. More concerning though, in the example we have, is that there is a neighbour taking alcohol into Joyce during the evening. Now we are again, we all enjoy a drink, but with the diagnosis of dementia that Joyce has, that could be interacting um, with the medication that she needs. And because she may be, she becomes confused and upset having had a drink, now that is um, a greater cause for concern. So here is a great opportunity with the skills that the carers are bringing to support Joyce to escalate that, to raise that with their, their manager um, and potentially look to call some sort of uh, team meeting, a multidisciplinary meeting. Talk to Joyce about uh, the, uh, having a drink of an evening. Try and understand her points of view there, what, uh, what's important to her. But it is clearly now impacting on her potential safety, for example. Again, the carers, as you can see, contact the lasting power of attorney. And that, again, is a very positive, uh, positive move. And I'm, that, I commend that to, to the carers in this example. Um, but the LPA is, is you know, concerned that the, the, the uh, neighbours are, are not acting in Joyce's best interest. Um, and the attorney, though, accuses the carers of exaggerating. So we've got potentially two stories around what's in Joyce's best interest starting to become clear here. The problems escalate um, and the relationship between the carers uh, and the, the neighbors really starts to break down. And at this point, we will be looking to try and do something perhaps more formally. Uh, to bring in others that know Joyce well, her GP for example, maybe other members of the GP practice, the community nurse, those with specialisms around dementia, to explore exactly what is happening but keeping Joyce at the centre of our attention and our focus. The constant bombardment now indicates for me that there, this is moving from perhaps you know, a disagreement about how best to support Joyce into something a bit more concerning, potentially into a safeguarding issue. And it's almost you know, on a very frequent basis that the carers are raising these concerns. But the, it's the issue of alcohol here that I think is really important. The neighbors are continuing to give that to Joyce and that is causing her much more distress. And it's at this point, in this example, that we would need to potentially formalize things um, and look to you know, raising a safeguarding inquiry, as it's called, under the CARE Act. So what's the impact for Joyce? Well, in this example, we've seen her become increasingly distressed and anxious as the sort of conflict between the neighbours and the carers um, evolves. And what we must you know, remind ourselves is that we, we don't become distracted. We're there to care for Joyce, we're there to support Joyce. Um, and while the neighbours have had an important role in her life, her needs have changed. 
difference. But let's, let's not get distracted by um, disagreements or worse between other people uh, in this example. The carers seem to be potentially more focused on the neighbours and vice versa than, as I say, on, on Joyce. Um, the lasting power of attorney was reliant on those neighbours uh, and is being told different stories on both sides. The concern here is that the care package breaks down. This, most importantly, leads then Joyce at increased risk. So a number of key questions that I think that this case really helps us draw out those safeguarding concerns for Joyce. Being locked in her house, is that right? Well, we have to understand, you know, is that risky? You know, we all want to, as I say, take, you know, have the opportunity to take risks in, in our lives. We all lock our own doors at night. I did it last night when I went to bed myself. So in and of, in and of itself, it may not be a safeguarding issue with a big S, but it may be an issue of safety with a small S, for example. But again, this is about supporting Joyce, uh, working with the, with the, the neighbours, but walking with other working with other people that know her about taking positive risks. If Joyce, for example, had wandered out of her house and been found you know, on the road, and it was a you know, busy road or something, or she was not able to find her way back to her home, then clearly a different set of circumstances. And we would absolutely need to explore that. But there are many other ways that, can be, that we can support Joyce rather than you know, locking the door. Assistive technology, for example, could alert someone if Joyce, for example, opens the door and starts to, you know, to, to leave the house. What about the relationship between the neighbours and the carers in this example? Well, again, as long as it doesn't distract and as long as it doesn't cause uh, Joyce distress uh, or anxiety, then you know, neighbours and the, the people around the person we're caring for hold an awful lot of really key and important information. And it's a fine line. You know where, where someone's trying to sort of give that advice and support and care staff like yourselves are going in with a real you know skill and expertise we mustn't get distracted by that but also look for opportunities to seek you know useful and helpful information the most important person here though in this example is Joyce and when those that relationships maybe starts to change or it starts to deteriorate you know, look for opportunities to, to hold a, an informal meeting or maybe something even a bit more formal through a multidisciplinary team meeting, for example, drawing in others that can explore those issues. What is driving the behaviour of the neighbours, for example? Why are they so concerned? Why are they so potentially insistent in this example that things should be done a particular way? We're worried about the risks to Joyce, absolutely, in lots of ways. And people with dementia do have sometimes impaired abilities to judge and understand risks in their day-to-day -day lives. You know, what is the best way to, to think about those risks? And again, it comes back to this issue of positive risk-taking. We can't eliminate all risk from a person's life. We can't eliminate all the risks for Joyce. But what we can and must do is identify them when they present themselves and work through them so we can keep Joyce as safe as possible. Our first question from providers is, within home support scenarios, how can we communicate with loved ones to ensure freedom and dignity remain? It's a great question um, because um, it, is, it is all about communication um, and I think how we do that is critical to how that care and support is received and experienced. So we need to communicate with loved ones with honesty, with, re with respect. Um, if they're telling you something that may be sort of difficult to hear, it's sort of checking our own, own emotions as, as well. Um, listening very carefully to the story that you're, that, that's being shared with you or the piece of information that uh, you're being given. I mean, in a way, it's 
um, privilege is probably the right word because somebody is telling you something that could be critically helpful uh, to caring for their loved one, for that person in, in their own home. I mean, I always try and approach um, you know, the, the situations of being someone in their own home with maybe their family around them as, as a, absolutely I'm a guest. I'm a guest into their lives at this particular moment. Um, so it's incumbent upon me, it rests on my shoulders to, to do the best that I can to make sure I've absolutely understood that the, the information that I'm being given and I act on it as well. That doesn't mean though that you can't have a different view or dis disagree. disagree. You can't explain something differently that may not be the best way to, to solve a problem or to a, a address a, a concern. But I think starting from a position of sort of honesty, open, open, openness and transparency um, will, will set things off in the, in the right way. As I say, it doesn't mean that you have to agree with all the information that's being shared, but all of the information is critically helpful for you to, to do the good jobs that you do. Our second question is, when gathering further information, what are the best methods to use when communicating with those who have dementia? It's remembering dementia does affect the ability of a person to com communicate. So um, when trying to gather, you know, sort of more information to understand a situation that, that you might be concerned about, it may be a safeguarding issue, it, it may be not, it may be an issue around, around their care and support. Um, remembering, you know, knowing the person. So are they better in the morning or the, in the, than the afternoon? Um, are they, do they um, have a better relationship with maybe one of your team? Could they support you when you're trying to talk about something that may be, may be difficult or, or challenging, possibly even dis distressing? Uh, using uh, simple sentences, short sentences, uh, maybe recognising the need to, to repeat information, but not forgetting that information can be given not just as we speak, but also it could be written down for somebody. We could use we could use the short videos. We could use the television. We could use uh, pictures. We could use diagrams. All of those things could play uh, as a very uh, a, a, as a as a package to help somebody communicate with us, so we can best care care for them and, and support them in in maybe what might be quite difficult situations. So communication indeed is a two-way thing. Of course, we're wanting to both receive information to understand how, how to best support someone with dementia, but equally it's how we send that, that information. So as I say, thinking carefully about what you need to communicate, uh, breaking it down into perhaps smaller you know, pieces, uh, chunks, if you like. Um, the time of day, as I said, who's, who's in the room? Could a family member be helpful to you uh, communicating for the person that, that you're caring for, looking for opportunities to summarise as well, uh, looking for information, looking for opportunities to check out that, they've, that they have understood the information that you want to, to, to give them and the information that you want them to tell you about. Uh, and they may communicate you know, some of that non-verbally as well you know, in terms of their behaviour, maybe it's a noise, maybe it's a, uh, an expression on their face, will all help you and your, you know, your colleagues communicate in the best way that helps them and helps you provide that, that essential care and support. Thank you for watching. If you would like more information, please visit Norfolk and Suffolk Care Support .co .uk, where you'll find further training on our learning portal. The link for this website is in the description down below.